My name is Caroline Lozer. I'm with the Lewin Group. Welcome to the webinar, Interdisciplinary Care Teams for Older Adults. This is the fifth webinar in the 2017 Geriatric Competent Care webinar series. The audio portion of the presentation will automatically stream through your computer. Phone lines for this presentation are also available. To access the number, click the black phone widget at the bottom of your screen. Today's session will include a 60-minute presenter-led discussion, followed up with 30 minutes for a discussion among the presenters and participants. This session will be recorded in a video replay, and a copy of today's slides will also be available at https colon slash slash www.resourcesforintegratedcare.com. Continuing medical education and continuing education credits are available at no additional cost to participants. If you are interested in receiving credit for this webinar, AGS is accredited by ACCME to provide continuing medical education for physicians and by NASW to provide continuing education for social workers. CMS is also accredited by IACET to issue CEUs. You'll see on this slide that we've laid out the various continuing education credit options. If you are a social worker, you could obtain continuing education credit through NASW if you complete the pretest at the beginning of the webinar and complete the post-test. If you are a physician, you could obtain CMEs through AGS if you complete the pretest at the beginning of the webinar and complete the post-test. CMS is also offering CEUs for other individuals looking to obtain credit for attending this webinar. In order to obtain these credits, you must complete the post-test through CMS's learning management system. Additional guidance about obtaining credits and accessing the links to the pre-test and post-test can be found within the Continuing Education Credit Guide in the resource list on the left-hand side of your screen or at Resources for Integrated Care website. This webinar is supported through the Medicare Medicaid Coordination Office at the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. MMCO is developing technical assistance and actionable tools based on successful innovations in care models, such as this webinar series. To learn more about current efforts and resources, please visit our website, or follow us on Twitter for more details. Our Twitter, Twitter handle is at integrate underscore care. So at this time, I'd like to introduce our moderator. Carol Regan is a senior advisor to Community Catalyst Center for Consumer Engagement and Health Innovation. And she has over 30 years of experience with national and state-based public policy and advocacy organizations. Carol? Thank you, Caroline, and welcome, everyone. Um, good morning or good afternoon, depending on where you are. Um, I'm delighted to be uh, moderating, uh, again, one of the series of geriatric competent care that we work with the Lewin Group um, through the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services. Um, Community Catalyst has really been interested in this work because one of our goals at the center is to um, work on policies and practices that improve the care for older adults and other vulnerable populations. And the Geriatric Competent Care Series is part of our educational efforts um, around improving those models of care. So today, <clears throat> I'm really interested to introduce, um, pleased to be introduced to our four speakers. Um, I'll introduce them all now, and then we'll do some quick polls to get a sense of who you are on the phone, and then we'll, um, we'll, we'll, we'll let the faculty take it over. So first, I want to introduce Dr. Gwendolyn Grady Dansby. She's been the medical director for the PACE program of Southeastern Michigan since 2001. She's a board certified in internal medicine and geriatrics and is a fellow at the American College of Physicians. Dr. Grady graduated from Wayne State University School of Medicine and joined the Henry Ford Health System in 1987 before joining PACE. Dr. Grady speaks extensively on healthy aging, caregiving, and Alzheimer's dementia. She's also begun to study the role that PACE has on facilitating controlling hospital utilization through understanding the role of care coordination. She's been a consistently named top doc in her field 
Um, and in 2015, she was the winner of the Detroit Business Healthcare Hero Award in the physician category, and the Henry Ford Health System presented her with the Diversity Hero Award. So we're very thrilled to have Dr. Grady leading us off here. Then we'll hear from Sandra White, who is the Director of Operations East for the Pace of Southeastern Michigan in Detroit, where she manages and oversees the social work department at three soon-to-be-four centers. She currently leads the day-to-day -day operations for two fully operating centers in Detroit, and she's also a liaison for other senior community organizations that partner with PACE to ensure quality services and care for its members. She leads the partnership with the Presbyterian Villages of Michigan and the Greenhouse Project staff to develop the Weinberg Greenhouse Homes for Seniors to reside in as an alternative to a nursing home setting. Sandra's got a master's degree in social work and has been a clinical social worker in medical settings for 26 years. Ellen LaSalvia will be our next speaker. Speaker, She's the Director of Long-Term Services and Support and Home and Community-Based Services for Buckeye Health Plan in Ohio, an affiliate of Centene. At Buckeye, she's responsible for the development and maintenance of quality coordination of care initiatives for the Medicare Advantage, Medicaid, and MyCare products. She also has served as their manager for service coordination and before that did discharge planning and education for their care management team. Ellen's also worked as a substance use and mental health case manager and a community psychiatric support provider. Ellen is a licensed social worker and a certified case manager. And then finally, we're pleased to have Olivia Richard join us. She's a consumer who's been enrolled in the One Care Financial Alignment Demonstration in Massachusetts since it started. She's a member of the Commonwealth Care Alliance Health Plan and has had firsthand experience working with a care team. So you can see we have an incredible um, group of speakers uh, that will follow. So let's turn quickly to the polls um, and so we can see a little bit about who's on the phone and who's joined us. So this is the agenda quickly. We'll have the polls and then we'll talk about the role of an interdisciplinary care team, strategies for implementing them, and then some other consumer experiences. Okay, so you can see this poll in front of you. Which best describes your professional area? And just choose one. Health administration, provider, pharmacy, social work. You can see the categories there. So please pick one. And just take a couple more seconds. Great. Let's close this poll and see what we got. Great. Okay, well, so we have a quarter of the folks are in social work. We've got a good number of people in health plan management staff, terrific. Um, about one out of five are in some kind of direct provider, many in health administration, some advocacy and policy research, and great, great distribution, thanks. So the next poll. So can you also identify what's your primary role? So we know your profession, but do you work as an administrator, clinician, educator? You can see the list, care coordinator, maybe a family caregiver. Um, choose one that best maybe describes your primary role currently. Great. A couple more seconds. Great. Thank you. Okay, let's see what the poll says here in terms of primary role. So pretty much reflects pretty much reflects the profession. So we've got one out of five administrators, many clinicians, educators, and a, almost a third are care coordinators. Great, great, thank you. Okay, so we have one last poll. So we'd like to know a little bit more about the setting in which you work. Do you work at a managed care organization or plan, an ambulatory care setting, maybe at a long-term care facility or home care agency? community-based organizations. You can see the list here. It just describes best the work setting in which you do your work. I'll take a few more seconds. Okay, let's see the results of this poll. Ah, great. Okay, so about a third or managed care organizations, several in long-term care facilities and community-based organizations. Wonderful, providing services. And we've got some ambulatory care and some academic research. Great. We have a great distribution of people professionally and in settings on this call. So we, we um, will anticipate a rich uh, Q&A session at the end of this. 
So thank you for taking the time, and now we can turn it over to the presentation. So I'd like to introduce Dr. Gwendolyn Grady. Hello. You can go ahead and switch the slide there. This is an exciting opportunity, and I'm glad to be able to talk about an area that I think is extremely important, uh, whether you're in healthcare administration or whatever your area, simply because what we're seeing is we're seeing a changing demographic, especially as it relates to this aging population. And as a result of that, we're going to need to start thinking a little bit differently about how we provide services. And so I'm going to start this morning talking about, or this afternoon based on where you are, I'm going to start off talking about what I call the WWWs of the interdisciplinary care team. I'm going to talk about why these care teams are important and will continue to be important in the 21st century. I'm going to talk about what they are, and then we're going to end up with who is included in the interdisciplinary care team. So as far as the why, we can change the slide. The next one, please. I, there was an article in the New York Times in September of this year, and many of you may have seen it, and the slide was entitled, The High Cost of Failing America's Costliest Patients. And as you might imagine, many of those costliest patients are our aging population as well as the dual eligible population. Dr. Kular had a powerful quote as a part of that article, and it states, people want health not health care. And those who require the most health care get the least health. High need, high cost patients with multiple or severe medical conditions feel this most acutely. The article went on to state that we needed to look at methods, systems, models to provide better care. And this is going to provide some innovation. It goes on to talk about models that can provide that type of care especially integrated care, and one of the models that it referenced was PACE. There are other models, obviously, that provide the integrated model of care. So what we're going to focus on this morning or today is extremely important as it relates to what does the model of care, or in this particular case, the integrated care team model, look like, and how can that model provide the best care to this population. Next slide, please. So why is this important? By 2020, more than 25% of the population will be over the age of 65. So think, of that, uh, think about that for a few seconds. Of those over the age of 65, the greatest percentage of growth will occur among women and those over the age of 85. And the other thing that we're going to be seeing in terms of what are now considered minority populations will continue to grow as well. With age, we know that there's a greater prevalence of chronic diseases and dementia, and about one quarter of Medicare outlays are for the last year of life, and this is unchanged from 30 years ago. In addition, availability of health care providers will decline significantly after 2020, and why is that? Because many baby boomers will be retiring 2020. And so what we're going to see is that the workforce for those who are going to are presently providing care for this population will, decle will decline. And that's going to also significantly impact how we provide care. Next slide. Additional wise, when we look at chronic diseases in this older population, the leading cause of death in 1900 was acute infections and acute illnesses. In the 21st century, the leading causes of death are chronic diseases and degenerative illnesses. And among those over the age of 65, 80% have at least one chronic disease. 50% have at least two chronic diseases. And when you couple chronic diseases with functional decline, that is actually an increased need, again, for the types of services that we're talking about as a part of the team. When we look at Medicare Medicaid enrollees, 59% of those will have arthritis as well as the percentage of chronic diseases. 20% have diabetes, and the largest incidence occurs in those over the age of 75. That's a staggering statistic. 13% of this population 
will have a mental illness, and it is estimated that 65 million have a diagnosis of depression. The risk of Alzheimer's dementia doubles every five years. Dementia is actually a disease of the elderly, and so the highest incidence of Alzheimer's will be in those over the age of 80. Among Medicare, Medicaid enrollees, on an average, have 25% more chronic diseases than non-Medicare, Medicaid enrollees, and they are more likely than non-Medicare, Medicaid enrollees to have diagnoses of depression, Alzheimer's dementia, diabetes, heart failure, chronic kidney disease, COPD, asthma, stroke, and coronary artery disease. Next slide, please. So what are the interdisciplinary care teams? How do we define them? Next slide. When we think about an interdisciplinary care team, the, the operative word for me that comes to mind is collaboration, collaboratively working together. And the collaborative model is an arrangement between multiple disciplines, multiple professions. There are multiple terms that are used for this, interdisciplinary, interprofessional, multi-professional, multidisciplinary, but basically it all boils down to professionals being able to come together, work collaboratively, be able to interchangeably affect and coordinate the care of those that they're providing services for. Next slide. In addition, when you think about teamwork, it's a dynamic process involving two or more health professionals. What I like about this definition is dynamic. When you think about interdisciplinary teams coming together, they are not static. The need of that aging adult determines which team members are important. And at the end of the day, the intent is to be able to add value, added patient, organizational, and staff outcomes. Next slide, please. Now I'd like to talk about what I consider to be the 10 characteristics of a high-functioning interdisciplinary care team. There are 10 characteristics that we consider. I am not going to highlight each of these because you'll have the opportunity to review these at a later time, or if you have additional questions, we can cover those at the end. So number one, leadership and management for a high functioning interdisciplinary team to operate and to maximize the benefit, you must have clear definition around a leader. There has to be a clear leader, that leader has to give clear direction, and that leader, even though the definition here says it's a leader who acts and listens, I can turn that around. It really should be a leader who listens and based on what they hear, acts. Number two, communication. Good communication skills. We have a saying here in our organization that good communication consists of open communication, direct communication, honest communication, and respectful communication. For any interdisciplinary care team to function to its best, there must be good communication. Number three, personal rewards, training, and development. Again, this emphasizes the importance of training and giving people the tools that they need to be able to perform the task. Number four, appropriate resources and procedures. It is extremely important to have structures in place, and Sandra is going to touch on this a little bit more, in terms of meetings, organizational factors, and team, meter, and team members being able to work, come together in a, in, a, in a general location to talk about what those needs are. And being at the same table is actually much more effective than being on a phone. We found that out. Number five, an appropriate skill mix. You have to have sufficient and appropriate skills and competencies. Do not assume that people have the competencies that they need. Ask, have ways of testing whether or not they have the competencies, and then provide those tools for them. Next slide, please. Climate, it's important to have a team climate of trust. That must be the culture for a high-performing interdisciplinary team. Number seven, individual characteristics. What I'd like to pull out of this particular characteristic has to do with reflective practice. Some of you may be familiar with reflective practice, 
but we have found that reflective practice allows a team to come together and look at what happened, what went well, what did not go well, why didn't it go well, and what are we going to do differently so that this doesn't happen again. If it went well, let's figure out what we're going to do to make certain that we continue to do that. And if it did not, what do we need to do differently? Clarity of vision, number nine, quality and outcomes, and number 10, respecting and understanding the roles. And that's shared power and joint working together. Next, please. So who makes up that interdisciplinary care team? Next slide. There are a list of individuals that make that up. But what's extremely important to emphasize here is that it is dynamic. And so the subset of interdisciplinary team members that are needed for one participant or patient for one set of problems may be completely different based on what the need is. So we have to be sensitive enough to understand that the need will really drive which interdisciplinary team member is indicated or which interdisciplinary team member is important. Now what I'd like to do, I've talked about, you know, why, the what and the who. I'm going to turn it over to Sandra to talk about, so how do we implement this interdisciplinary care team? Sandra? Thank you, Dr. Grady. Making a team work, strategies for implementing care teams. Next slide, please. Bill Jackson is right when he states, the strength of a team is each individual member and the strength of each member is its team. The interdisciplinary care team must work together collaboratively to make that team strong. Next slide, please. Let's look at some of the key strategies for making the interdisciplinary care team work. We will look at team leadership, small meetings, creative thinking, and interdisciplinary thinking. Next slide, please. Key strategies for making interdisciplinary care teams work. Team leadership. Having a knowledgeable and competent team leader is a must. This is one who effectively works collaboratively with the team to help make and achieve the patient-centered care that is needed. This team leader is able to provide that ongoing support, guidance, instruction, and direction while building a cohesive, integrated team in a working environment. Next slide, please. The team leader must be knowledgeable of its team and that team leader is capable of identifying the strengths of the interdisciplinary care team members and knowing when to involve a particular discipline based upon whether that need is psychosocial or medical. In summary, the team leader helps the interdisciplinary care team stay focused on what I like to call what's important. That creates a winning team. Next slide, please. Now, let's look at some small meetings. Oftentimes, it is important to take a larger group and break it into a smaller interdisciplinary group based upon the needs of the beneficiary or that patient. The meeting should consist of meeting around a particular problem or concern that that patient sees as the problem. Building trust, clarifying roles, communicating openly and effectively. Appreciating diversity of ideas is very important in these small teams and making certain that the interdisciplinary care team stays focused on the task at hand. Next slide, please. Now, here's a slide I like a lot, and I want to focus on creative thinking. And this is thinking beyond the ordinary, thinking beyond what each discipline would normally do in a particular case. And I like to call this thinking outside the box. So when the team is thinking outside the box, 
keep in mind that they're thinking differently. They're thinking unconventionally. They're thinking of a new way and a new perspective of handling the problem at hand. Next slide, please. Key strategies for making interdisciplinary teams work. This is interdisciplinary thinking at its best. When you have all of the disciplines coming together and everyone is focused in on the problem and everyone has one mindset, that mindset is to solve the problem at hand. That creates for a winning team. You have many players, you have many hands, but you only have one mind to address the issue at hand. Next slide, please. This slide, good team building problem solving skills. A couple of things that a good team want to know when they're problem solving is evaluating the problem. What is it that we're here for? Gathering all the information from each discipline and then breaking that problem down into smaller pieces if you can or smaller situations. Identifying solutions also is a good thing, too. When you identify solutions, then figure out what are the best solutions and then take action. Examine results, and then after you examine your results of the problem, test it, review it, see if it works, bring the team back together and figure out what worked and what did not work. Next slide, please. Now, Dr. Grady and I will work together on the case studies, and I would like to just focus on case studies and demonstrate how the interdisciplinary team's approach to a particular case is based upon the medical needs, the social needs, and the specialty needs. Next slide, please. So I'm getting ready to turn it back over to Dr. Grady. Thank you, Sandra. So the first case we're going to examine is Ms. SWH, a 66-year-old female who presented to us with the history of metastatic lung cancer, chronic pain, malnutrition, functional decline, polypharmacy, and she also had a history of mental illness. When this person presented to us initially, a large of our emphasis, a large amount of our emphasis was really on her medical conditions. Her metastatic lung cancer was actually terminal, so there was no additional treatment that was going to change the outcome in terms of her cancer. So we began to look at several areas from a medical perspective. Number one, how should we treat this cancer? We finally identified that the best way to treat this was to have a discussion with the participant or the patient regarding end-of-life care, and that's what we did, and she was actually enrolled into a comfort care or an end-of-life care program. The next thing we needed to do is we had to address her chronic pain, but we, we recognized early that her chronic pain was not just physical. Yes, there was a medical component, but there was also a spiritual component and there was an emotional component. And if we did not address each of those components, we were not going to adequately address her chronic pain. So the providers looked at medications and identified what was the appropriate medications. Behavioral health intervened and started talking about what were the mental illness issues that were also contributing to the pain and providing support and interventions. We had our chaplain come aboard and talk about some of the areas that she needed to resolve that she hadn't had a chance to talk about, but she needed to. We had the social workers come aboard and help us with the emotional aspects, and that was one of the ways, using an interdisciplinary approach, that we were able to address her pain. Malnutrition was another issue. We did have our nutritionists talk about supplements, but it was more than that, and Sandra will uh, address this in more detail. We needed to go into the home and see what was needed in the home to be able to address the issues of her nutrition. We also understood that her malnutrition and pain in some ways was impacting her function, so rehab got involved and talked about dural medical equipment and what other things we could do. And then there was polypharmacy. When she came into our program, she was on 22 medications. Coming together as a team and discussing this lady on a regular basis as a team, we were able to reduce her medications down to approximately 10 to 12 medications. At some point, the IDT was uncomfortable or the inter, uh, disciplinary team was uncomfortable sometimes with her ability to be in the community. 
but coming together and talking on a regular basis, we were able to resolve this. Sandra, talk about what some of the psychosocial issues were and what were some of the other things that we did. Absolutely. So one of the things we recognized right off the bat was this individual who came into our program, her lights, her gas, and her water was scheduled to be shut off. So quickly the social worker was able to go out in the community and work and provide resources to make sure that the gas, lights, and water was not cut off. We also realized that she did not have a functioning stove in her home. So what we did, too, we decided we're going to buy her a new stove. So we provided the resources for that. We got the stove hooked up in her home, and everything was great from a social work point of view at that time. The registered dietitian made sure that she provided daily frozen meals to go out to the home, and our transportation team made sure that those meals went to the home as well. The dietary team worked very closely with the transportation team on that. Now in terms of the transportation team, they did a lot more too because they took her to all of her specialty appointments. They made sure that all of her medications was delivered to her home as well as her incontinent supplies. Her days for coming into the center were increased from two days to four days, and so transportation picked her up from her home. A Cena was at the home to make sure that she was bathed, clean, and assisted on the bus, and we made sure that everyone had an opportunity to get her to the building or our day center safely. The other thing is the RN case manager made weekly visits to the home, and then the RN case manager talked to her, and she told her, you know what? I feel like I have, I'm losing my dignity. My hair is coming out. And that nurse went out and not only just did medical care for her, but she provided her with a wig to help keep her social, uh, her self-esteem up and help her keep her pride. The social worker and RN case manager went out on a weekly basis to the home and worked with the son to see how they could help him as well. The rehab team went to the home, and as Dr. Grady stated, spiritual care was involved. Behavioral health team worked very closely with us. The day health center engaged her in all of the activities, and it was very wonderful when she was in the day health center. And we kept communication going with her and her son. Next slide, please. The integrative slide is right there, and it just shows you how the team works together. Next slide, please. And now I'll turn the case number two over to Dr. Grady. Hi. Based on the amount of time that we have left, we can always come back and discuss case number two now. But to try to stay on track, because I know that there are other speakers, I think what Sandra and I would like to do now is we're going to go ahead and go to the next slide, and we'd like to talk about lessons learned. So next slide, please. So the lessons that we learned. Number one, do not assume that another person heard and understand the same thing you did. Allow for mistakes. Make it safe for people to be transparent. And it's okay to agree that you disagree. Constantly educate each other. Education, education, education is extremely important. Remember that we are here for the patient. Don't forget to ask the patient and caregiver for their input. That's very valuable. When in doubt, ask for another opinion. Include the frontline staff. It could be home health aides, nursing home, or excuse me, nursing assistants, drivers, or whoever. Decisions can be changed. We can always change decisions that we made. Follow up and debrief. Dr. Grady? In the summary, the interdisciplinary care teams for older adults require certain skill sets. You must have positive leadership and management. Number two, commitment to think outside the box. Number three, the ability to collaborate, which simply means to work together. Number four, willingness to get out of your comfort zone. Number five, know where and when to ask for help. 
Number six, communicate, communicate, communicate. We have a saying in our organization, eight times, eight ways. And finally, keep what's important first, and that is the aging adult. Thank you, Dr. Grady. So the next slide, please. So here, keep in mind that the interdisciplinary care team, when it comes together, works together, it creates a wonderful life for our patients. And I will turn it over to Ellen. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Today I'm going to be talking about the successful clinical care of an interdisciplinary care team um, as we talk about those individuals that benefit from LTSS services. Next slide, please. LTSS, what is it? If you're not familiar with LTSS services, the LTSS stands for Long-Term Services and Supports. These are services are provided to Medicare and Medicaid members of all ages who need ongoing help with activities of daily living, um, both ADLs and IADLs, due to either aging or disability. Uh, the purpose of these particular services is really to support that member to live or, and work or live and work in the setting of their choice. And settings may include a member's home or it may be a provider owned or controlled residential setting such as a nursing, nursing facility or other institutional settings if you're an individual that might have um, developmental uh, disabilities. Next slide please. In looking at LTSS, you can look at it in two, in, a, in, a, um, in two models. One would be HCBS, and those are your home and community-based services. And then our second model would be those that uh, belong to the LTC, or long-term care model. Individuals that associate with the HCBS mo module um, are individuals that reside within their homes within the community and these can be older adults and or persons with disabilities. In these, with our HCBS membership, care managers work to ensure, uh, right along with the member, that the right level of services are in place to maximize independence within their home and communities and to assure that they are able to achieve the quality of life that they desire. They do this through working to address the needs of that particular individual, as it pertains to functional limitations and assistance that may need, be needed with activities of daily living or instrumental activities of daily living. Services within the HCBS module, model can include services such as additional personal care attendant services to assist with daily bathing. They can also include services such as transportation and at times um, pest control in order to assure that the homes in which individuals reside are, are free from any, um, uh, and any pests that may be making that home um, unlivable. In our second model, the long-term care model, care can be administered in, within an assisted living, though depending on the particular um, state in which um, you're in, that assisted living can also be considered an HCBS um, model. So that is very specific to the waiver um, within the state. Um, in, this, in the long-term care model itself, providers offer skilled nursing care, occupational therapy, speech therapy, physical therapy, dietary management, dialysis, and or hospice and palliative care in-house, which would be within that residential um, facility that the individual considers their home. Next slide, please. If we are comparing the two LTS modules, models, you can see that from a home and community-based perspective, these the, uh, services um, that I spoke of um, uh, previously can include personal services, personal care attendance services, medical and non-medical help um, with daily living tasks, emergency home response system, home delivered meals. These particular services are provided in the home um, of an individual's choosing. It could be an apartment, it could be in a home that they own, it could be a home that they reside in with a family member or a primary caregiver, um, and depending upon the waiver, could be an assisted living facility as well. 
if we are looking at our long-term care um, or facility-based model, their medical and personal services to help specifically with daily living tasks. And the facility is designated to provide the LTSS to the residents within that nursing facility. Services are provided by staff and caregivers who work directly with the facility, whereas in the home and community-based model, those services are provided by agencies uh, within the community, and they are, can also be provided by independent providers, so those individuals that are independently employed to provide a particular service, such as personal care um, attendant services. Next slide, please. Now, if we bring in our um, discussion, previous discussion from Sandra and Dr. Grady and bring in and layer on our ICT process and within the LTSS area, we can see that ICT participants are included based on the type of services the member is receiving. So those ICT per participants um, can be different based on being in an HCBS model or an L long-term care um, model. If you're looking for recommendations based on ICT comp composition that are a little more in depth than um, we have been able to previ previously share, if you're looking at an individual that is receiving HCBS services, the ICT participants would include the member, a caregiver, a primary care physician, a psychiatrist if applicable, and in-home HCBS providers. Um, these could be personal care attendants, nurse, social workers, counselors, based on the services available for the particular HCBS waiver uh, within your state. Within the long-term care model, you would look at a member, a caregiver. Um, the caregiver could be a friend or family, or it could be somebody who has a power of attorney or a guardian. Um, the PCP, a psychiatrist if applicable, the facility social worker, the nurse, physical therapist, occupational therapist, and dietitian there at the facility, and any community-based provider that individual may still elect to see. Optional participants may include but are not limited to specialist friends or social network support. Um, one example of that could be a church pastor. One of the things about the ICT is if you have a larger group and Sandra spoke of this, is if you go in, if you have an identified particular issue, it may be necessary to take that larger group and make it into a smaller group to address a, a very particular issue uh, that a member may want to address in order to achieve the goals that they have, they have set for their ICT team. Um, the ICT team should be a collective body that represents and supports the goals identified by the member to achieve a quality of life desired by that individual. Next slide. The inclusion of both HCBS providers and long-term care providers is an essential piece for the ICT success puzzle from a clinical perspective. HCBS providers can often be the eyes and ears in the home um, for an ICT group. Uh, specifically in Ohio, our care managers do home-based visits uh, with our members, so they can also uh, be some eyes and ears, but they're not there every day, whereas a personal care attendant can be there every day and may bring additional insights into that ICT discussion through observation and daily interaction with an individual. From a long-term care provider, they're the eyes and ears at the facility. Um, one example of this could be that as an activities coordinator, um, you have the ability, the unique ability, to be able to engage on a social aspect with individuals and hear the conversations that occur in a, in a non-pressurized situation. So the ability to bring forth information that is relevant, that may not necessarily seem relevant um, to, say, a primary care physician or to the member themselves and being able to link those items that might not seem linkable at first. HCBS and long-term care providers both connect on a personal level with individuals, and they supply perspectives that not, might not otherwise be, know, be known, and they also have the ability to, on a day-in and day-out basis, support and reinforce member-selected plans and actions. Next slide, please. 
LTSS services are unique, so education for the overall ICT is recommended. Um, ensuring that the LTSS benefit, benefits are known and understood by the team allows individuals to be able to come up with those out-of-box solutions. So from a ben what benefits are, are available? Benefits are dependent on the LTS waiver that an individual participates in. Some common benefits include but are not limited to personal care, attendant services, transportation, home delivered meals, emergency response systems, home modification, and in some states assisted living items that we have covered before, but they may not be readily known to all ICT participants. So having a full view of the benefits available to an individual allows for creative solutions when problems arise. What is also helpful, helpful is when can LTSS benefits be accessed once qualification for a waiver is determined and an individual has accepted a waiver. For example, there are times if an individual has a skilled a skilled stay at a nursing facility, and in order to return home, they have to have pet, um, some pests removed from their home. Let's say they have an infestation of bed bugs and they need that taken take care of. There are, some, there are some waivers that don't allow those waiver services to take place until that individual is no longer receiving those skilled services. So it's important to recognize those when the ICT team is working to overcome barriers to um, meet the goals of the individual. The, this can be easily accomplished through the development of a frequently asked questions document. And basically, it's a one-page sheet that summarizes the benefits of the, that are very pertinent to LTSS. So everybody has that, that same information when the ICT, ICT team is meeting. Um, another area is to ensure that the care manager is prepared and is a subject matter expert on, in those particular areas. So the, any uh, barrier resolution can be streamlined through that individual. Um, the ICT team, because we, you can go from a large team to a smaller team, um, should have agreement on preferred communication methods and how, and how those communication methods work. Next slide. I did want to provide a case study on how an ICT um, team with the inclusion of LTSS providers has shown to be um, successful in clinical practice. Our case study is of a 66-year-old male. He has had a history of depression and paralysis at the waist level. Um, his ICT consisted of um, himself, the care manager, a waiver service coordinator, his primary care physician, and his personal care attendant. The identified need in the discussion with the ICT was that he was in need of a new electric wheelchair and that he also had flooring concerns. He had carpet um, within his residence, which was making it difficult to navigate in his electric wheelchair. Through the inclusion of that personal care attendant, we, uh, we were able as an ICT to be able to identify the barriers of the particular carpet throughout the home and, and in those specific rooms and be able to share that very specific um, information re regarding that. Um, and we're able to come together as a team to utilize the benefits related to his Medicare coverage um, for his new electric wheelchair. And then from an LTSS perspective, he had access to home modification services, and we were able to utilize those to uh, replace that carpet with uh, with floors and then through the personal care attendant and the partnership with the member, we're able to be able to test out floors, flooring to make sure that they would um, in the long term meet the, the needs um, of the new electric wheelchair that was coming in. I am now going to turn it over to Olivia Richard. Hello, sorry, it took me a minute to get off of uh, speaker there. Um, hi, my name is Olivia Richard. Uh, I am a member of the One Care program who receives uh, coordinated care through uh, Commonwealth Care Alliance. Um, I enrolled in Commonwealth Care Alliance as a health plan at the very beginning of the demonstration in 2013. Um, basically because I was getting really bad health care in fee-for-service, and the, the Medicare, Medicaid fee-for-service system was just not working for me. Um, 
I was at the point where I was repeatedly denied a new manual wheelchair uh, was and was trying to maintain my own chair uh, out of my own pocket and uh, pulled out some of those high school trade skills, uh, welded a little bit even, um, to try to get it uh, working. Uh, I was getting little to no community support within LTSS. Uh, I was in an agency model where I was receiving very few PCA hours. Uh, And as a result, my apartment became unhealthy to live in. I I had a lot of infestations. I had bed bugs. I didn't know I had bed bugs until I enrolled in the plan. Um, After I enrolled, the care coordinator came to my apartment and evaluated me. Uh, It was then that I realized I had a lot of unmet needs. I'm a pretty sharp tack, um, but it's really hard to look at yourself and say, hey, I'm not getting a lot of what I should get because I, I had just become so used to being underserved. Um, I mean, I was an advocate involved in setting up the demo to begin with. So I knew a lot about the fact that there was going to be a position called the LTS coordinator. And as soon as I enrolled, I I asked for a long-term service coordinator to be assigned to me to help. Uh, They came to my home and did an assessment. We clicked immediately. Uh, For me, I knew she was someone I could trust. She saw my living conditions and all the challenges I was experiencing firsthand. And she even saw things I didn't. I didn't realize it was abusive, some of the practices that that I was experiencing. Um, and she assisted me in changing uh out of the agency model into the consumer-directed model where I'm able to hire my own PCA. Um, She assisted me and my care team assisted me because my care team included a physical therapist um, in getting a new custom wheelchair, which was huge. It increased my mobility tenfold. They approved a deep cleaning of the apartment. I was able to get more PCA hours in the consumer-directed model. Um, I have one PCA that I rely on. Just by luck, she lives in the apartment above me. (laughs) And I have a per diem PCA that I've hired one of the college kids, um, you know, if my regular PCA is sick. Uh, she'll come on over. I give her a call and and help me out. Um, and my PCA is considered part of my team. She's put input in on on some things. Like, you know, I didn't realize how bad my shower chair had gotten. And my PCA threw, threw in her two cents on that thing. Um, I don't get my primary care from Commonwealth Care Alliance because Commonwealth Care Alliance runs um, uh, CCC, uh, Community Care, Uh, it's it's a clinic. Um, I go to Fenway Health because it's nationally renowned for LGBTQIA uh, culture and services, and it was the one part of my health care that was working for me before the demonstration. So I decided, you know, I'm just going to keep this part and we'll see what happens with the rest of it. It's worked really well. Um, I was recently admitted to the hospital for a behavioral health issue. Um, My longtime service dog passed away. It hit me really hard. I ended up with severe depression. Um, 
And when I was in the hospital, my care coordinator introduced me to a behavioral health specialist from my care team. And um, she's a licensed social worker. And she's actually now become my care partner in that she really coordinates a lot of my care. Um, She has a nurse practitioner that oversees my care within the CCA model, and they will talk with Fenway. They'll talk with the Boston Center for Independent Living, where my long-term service coordinator is is at. Um, Everyone talks to everyone. Uh, at sometimes it's bad because it doesn't let me get away with stuff, but other times it's it, most of the time it's absolutely fantastic and I love it. Um, I was diagnosed as pre-diabetic recently, and during my reevaluation, I said I needed to work on my nutrition as my number one goal, and ultimately that's what Allie, the behavioral health specialist, my social worker, is going to help me with. Um, set me up with nutrition and all that stuff. Um, In my opinion, a good team means listening to the member, having the member be a part of the team, being attuned to when there are significant changes in a member's life that could trigger something, and being flexible. Um, And I want to thank all of you out there who do what you do because ultimately it allows people to live happy and fulfilled lives. Thank you. Wow. All right. Thank you so much, Olivia, and to the rest of our speakers, Dr. Grady, Sandra, and Ellen, for your presentations. This has been incredibly informative, and thanks so much for joining us today. Before we jump into our Q&A, we first wanted to point out, um, and maybe this is obvious to some of you, but we think it's still quite noteworthy, that any key takeaways from this webinar can also be applied to populations beyond older adults such as individuals with disabilities or individuals with intellectual and developmental disabilities. Uh, And Resources for Integrated Care would like to highlight two tools in particular that may assist providers and health plans with providing interdisciplinary care. We have the Disability Competent Care Self-Assessment Tool, and it's available to health, health plans and health systems evaluate their present ability to meet the needs of adults with functional limitations and to identify strategic opportunities for improvement. You can also check out the My Health, My Life Toolkit for individuals with intellectual and developmental disabilities, their family members or guardians, and their provider support team. So with that, we now have a few minutes for questions from the audience. And at this time, if you have any questions for our speakers, please submit them using the Q&A feature on the lower left of the presentation. You can type your comment at the bottom of the Q&A box, and then you press submit to send it in. All right, so we got several questions throughout the course of the presentation. Um, So I'm going to start with one of the first questions that we received. And this was during the first case study that Dr. Grady and Sandra presented. So the question is, in the over 65 age group, 50% have severe visual impairment or one of the major causes of visual impairment. Does the ICT format recognize a role for connecting either to the local organizations or the blind visually impaired who employ the specialized certified vision rehabilitation professionals or to employing them? So I guess the question is really just speaking to um, visual impairment and how that can be. Hi. Thank you. Um, I'd I'd really like to start off by thanking Olivia. That was an excellent overview. And to be able to see the, the impact that the ICT had on her quality of life is amazing, and that's really what this was all about. So, Olivia, thank you. That was an excellent overview. And then to comment on the question regarding visual impairment and what the organizations can do to make connections with organizations that can support individuals with visual impairments. I think that that was the question, correct? Yes. 
Yes. So there are two answers to that. First of all, from a medical perspective, and then we bring the rest of the team in, but I'm going to start there, is the ability to identify what the actual disability is as it relates to a visual impairment. So from a medical perspective, there will be a need to actually have an evaluation. So we start with that, whether it's an ophthalmologist or whether it's an optometrist, identifying that there is a visual impairment and the reason for it, because the cause of the visual impairment will also impact what the interventions are. So we'll start from a medical perspective and then talk about what other types of resources are available. We have used other resources in the community for people with visual impairments, and Sandra will comment on that. Thank you, Dr. Grady. Yes, so the visually impaired organizations, we are very familiar with them and we do use them and we incorporate them into the ICT. When we incorporate them into the ICT, we make sure that the patient is involved in the care as well, as well as making sure that that social worker is providing ongoing communication about the needs in the home and then the rest of the team members assist in the home as well. So yes, we make sure that anyone who comes into our organization or program is linked to the proper resources. And that helps build our team and make it stronger for our participant or patient. Wonderful, thank you. Uh, we'll turn now to a question for Ellen. Ellen, there was a question during your presentation that asked if you could speak to the health plan care coordinator's role in helping with LTSS planning, especially finding appropriate placement for patients discharging from hospitals to low, lower levels of care and or home care for LTSS patients. So just so I'm clear from the, the for the term care coordinators, is that equivalent to a care manager? Within our organization, we have care coordinators that support care managers, so I want to make sure that I'm speaking from the perspective of what the intent of the question was. The question didn't specify, so if you want to maybe speak to both perspectives. Certainly. So I think um, we, here within our plan, we do have specialized uh, care managers that receive additional uh, education and training in um, LTSS specifically um, in, in regards to being able to place um, individuals with the right, right um, let's say, agency or, or independent providers. One of the other items that we attempt to do is engage with our providers as well so we can learn what specialties they have and what specialties that their individualized staff can provide. So we have a data registry that's available to our care managers to be able to link those specialized services that an individual needs uh, with the provider that is able to provide those services. Um, it really is incumbent upon the networking um, with the providers in order to understand the, the skill set down to that very specific level. And we do that in combination with our provider relations department that works most closely with our providers, but also our care managers who are the referral source um, for any of our LTSS services that individuals may um, receive. Great, thank you, Ellen, that's helpful. All right, so I think we have another question and I'll just ask our presenters, I'll ask anyone to kind of chime in if you have any responses. The so one webinar participant asked us to speak more about including psychologists in the interdisciplinary care team. Has anyone tried to include psychologists and if so, what are some barriers to doing so? That, that's an excellent question, and I'll chime in, and then there may be other uh, presenters that'd like to have something to say. One of the things that we found in our organization that an extremely important member of the ICT basically is behavioral health, and there are a couple of reasons for that. Number one is we're looking at the demographics of this aging population. I mentioned some of the statistics. We're seeing a larger percentage of that population actually have mental illness diagnoses. 
Number two, what we're finding is resources in many communities for providing that type of help or assistance is basically limited, whether it's limited based on availability or whether it has to do with insurance or coverage. So we're finding that there is a greater and greater need demographically for people who have mental illness diagnosis and the need to make behavioral health a part of the interdisciplinary team. One of the things that we've done is they are a part of the interdisciplinary team. And so when there are issues, challenges, or concerns, that is actually a formal process whereby behavioral health is a part of reviewing what the concerns are, reviewing what the solutions are, and also following and managing. Because you can't put a process in place without a way to be able to follow and um, identify whether or not whatever you put in place works. As it relates to the barriers, I think a couple of barriers, based on uh, demo geographically where a particular program is located determines the availability. We recently had an a sister organization that based on where they are, there really is there's no availability of behavioral health. And so one of the things or one of the ways we've identified that actually will help with that barrier is to look at having virtual visits. And that's going to be something I think going into the future that we're going to look at more and more. So you don't have availability of behavioral health specialists, whether it's a social worker or a psychologist, being able to partner with organizations and entities that can provide those visits virtually will still be able to offer the resources and the services that you need to be able to service that particular population. I hope I answered that question, and if not, maybe they can chime back in. Sandra, you have any other thoughts? Okay, thank you. Wonderful. Thank you. Uh, this next question came in, Sandra, during your portion when you were discussing key strategies for making interdisciplinary care teams work. So one of our participants was wondering if the client attends his or her own team meeting. That is an excellent question. Thank you for asking. Yes. We make sure that our, we call them participants or patient, is involved in all of the meetings. Now, if they can't make it for some reason, be it medical or social, it's okay. What we do, if we can't see them face-to-face, -face, then we move to the next thing. Can we talk to them via conference call? And if we really need to do a face-to-face -face with them, and if they need, let's say, social worker, our in-case manager, or the rehab department, or another person, be it, it could be rec therapy, I'm not sure, it could be uh, a SENA. If they need that, we will go to their home. So to answer the question, yes, we try to make sure that the person we're talking about working with and trying to help solve problems with are partnering with us. Thank you. All right, thank you. We have a lot of questions coming in. We really appreciate the discussion. Uh, Ellen, I'll turn to a question for you, and this came up during your case study. Uh, and so one of our participants on the webinar was wondering what steps do you find helpful to get the primary care physician to the meeting? Excellent question. I think it's something that we're constantly challenged with. Um, I will say that the successes that we have seen is, is, is a few things. One, we do have a partnership with a physician group that does um, home visits, so they, they're visiting physicians and they go to the homes. And so we schedule our care management visits at the same time that the visiting physician will be there and conduct our ICTs with that already established and scheduled visit. In addition to that, we also have on-site um, ICT meetings with the entire team from those particular offices in each of the regions that we work with on a bi-week basis um, for urgent issues um, that may arise or complex issues that are ongoing that we're able to then discuss and we're able to patch in um, the member via telephone um, for those particular, particular meetings. 
Um, we have also seen success in having our care managers work with our, member, with our members and scheduling those primary care physician appointments so that they can attend those together um, and potentially telephoning in or bringing forth the other ICT members' questions um, via, you know, writing them down, bringing them in, and then communicating with the, re the remainder of the ICT team um, post that, that particular meeting. We also open up the availability to establish telephonic ICT meetings uh, that we hold on a regular and consistent basis. So we have them scheduled Monday, Monday, Wednesdays, Fridays from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. So there are established times that our provider network would be aware that they um, can participate at those particular times if their schedules allow. We we also do um, a lot of work with um, per potentially the uh, nurses that support the physicians within their offices, um, participating in the ICT on behalf of the physician or the specialty um, physician that an individual may see. But they do require creative, sol creative solutions in order to work at the engagement at that level. Great. Thanks for providing that extra detail. All right. We have another question, and Dr. Grady, I'm wondering if uh, you may know a good response to this. So the question is, some of our team members are used to a medical model where the doctor is, in quotes, in charge and directs the discussion and makes the decision. How do we encourage them to engage in a person-centered perspective and to respect and acknowledge everyone's expertise as well as the patient's wishes? Yeah, actually, that's a great question, and I'm going to start the commenting on that, but then I'm going to also let Sandra chime in. It is true that in healthcare, many people are used to a medically driven model, but what we're finding as the population ages and we're seeing more aging adults, that the medical model or the medical component of the model is still important. There usually does need to be a medical um, intervention because we're talking about people with chronic diseases. Remember when I showed the statistics that as the population ages, the number of chronic diseases also increases. So there needs to be a medical component. However, if we only do the medical component, what happens is we actually miss the opportunity to really influence from a holistic approach that aging adult, that aging individual's life. And so one of the things that we've done as a part of our team is that even though there is a physician or a mid-level or an advanced practice provider as a part of that ICT, we encourage participation from each discipline. And what that does is that allows them to feel that their input is being heard and that their input is valued. If when an individual gives an input, the, it always comes back to the physician making the final decision, then the other disciplines will feel that their input is not valued, and that's what we don't want to happen. So it's important to encourage other interdisciplinary members to have input. It's important for the team, including the physician, to acknowledge the value of that input. And at the end of the day, if what their input is actually influences what you do for that individual and the outcome, then people will feel the, they will feel the comfort to be able to have their input and then they'll feel like their input is valued. It's just important for people to feel like what they have to say is important and that it's valued. So when we have care plan meetings or we're focusing in on all of the aspects, the medical, the social issues of our patients, we look at who is around the table, as we stated before. And as Dr. Grady stated, it's not just medical. We're pulling in the other aspects. So if it is from a psychosocial area, then we break that down even further. Does that relate to behavioral health? Do we need to pull in all of the players? So one of the things that we do for care plans is we go through each discipline and make sure that their interventions are heard. Does it fit what we're trying to solve? What, when I say that is, when there is a problem, when there is a problem, is that discipline looking at that problem and saying, this is my input for that. 
this is how I can help. So we go around the table, and we do not leave any discipline out. So if it is our Cena, their input is just as valuable as the home care team, which is just as valuable as the recreational therapy team or the dietary or the rehab. We make sure that everyone is heard, and that goes back to that leader. That leader needs to make sure that everyone is heard, respected, and they have a voice in the problem solving. Great. Thank you both. All right. The next question in the queue is coming from an independent practitioner. Uh, and so this participant wants to know, how do I get the ICT to visit with my clients in the home on the same day at the same time? Three physicians, outpatient therapists, administrators, family, friends, et cetera, all have to meet together at the same time. Uh, any suggestions or is there any model for this sort of arrangement? I'll just I'll open up that up to the group or Ellen, I don't know if you have any thoughts to start? I would say that that is, is certainly a challenge. Um, while in person altogether is a good goal, I think, when trying to balance and organize so many different individuals, the ability to be flexible in how participation can occur will make that an easier task to accomplish. Um, if the ultimate goal is all in person, it's really providing, is, is identifying um, a handful of potential dates and times of when this could occur and uh, doing a personal invite and seeing if, if any of those particular times can work. Because if you start out by saying when can you do it versus narrowing it down to options available um, and, and selecting, you may, you may see better luck there. But it more so we've seen more success in having the flexibility of attendance be in multiple, multiple forms um, uh, of participation and not uh, only face-to-face. Great, thanks, Ellen. Um, so, Dr. Grady, you touched on this a little bit with the psychologists and you know some future in terms of telehealth. Uh, but we had a more broad question. I'm wondering if you can respond to, and it's just uh, the question is just simply how has technology impacted the interdisciplinary care team? Are there any examples you may want to provide or just speak to it generally? I, that's another great question. And one of the things that I referenced had to do with behavioral health and how you can now do virtual visits, which basically is telehealth. But one of the other things that our organization is looking at is we're looking at ways that we feel that we can best impact utilization. One of the places you don't want an aging elderly or an aging adult to be is in the hospital when you can help it. And one of the things when you look at the Medicare beneficiaries, and especially when you look at the Medicare and Medicaid, unfortunately, often these people end up in the hospital. So one of the things that we're looking at is what will be the impact of using telehealth to prevent hospitalizations and to reduce utilization for either hospitalizations or emergency room visits. Now, we're still in the process of really putting this process together, and it's not implemented yet. However, the literature does support that there is a place for doing telehealth. You have to have the right players at the table, number one. Number two, you have to have a way that you will be able to communicate with people. So whether that will be by providing them with a computer, whether it will be by providing them with a special telephone, whatever the, the mechanism is for communication, in order for it to be successful, there has to be the ability to be able to communicate. And there has to be um, ICD members that can actually then go into the community as well and to make certain that what we're saying is available and what we're saying we're doing is actually being done firsthand. So, you know, when, when we continue to look at 21st century medicine, I think we will reach a point where telehealth will be one of our primary ways of being able to provide care and one of the ways that the interdisciplinary care team will actually be able to maximize the care not just to an aging 
um, adult population, but also to the Medicare, Medicaid, or that dual eligible population. So I think that that's something the jury is still out. Can I throw in on this one? This is Olivia. Great. Yes, please, Olivia. I have to say, as a member, I I actually use um, my cell phone a lot uh, to communicate with my my care team. Um, texting is huge. Um, I when I was entering the hospital, when I was in the emergency room, I would I was texting my care coordinator to be like, uh, I think I'm going into the hospital, so um, don't be surprised if you get a call. Um, CCA Commonwealth Care Alliance has 24-hour uh, number that you can call if you're having a behavioral health crisis where there's someone on call all the time. Um, and they also have the community medic, which is basically an emergency department that comes to you, which is an innovation we, we have here in Massachusetts. Um, where it's a paramedic level EMT who can draw blood, um, run tests, and they get in contact with the doc over the phone to authorize meds. Um, it's it's one of the biggest services that uh, has kept me from needing to go to the emergency department so much for like UTIs and stuff like that. That's excellent. And let me chime in to just add on to what Olivia said. We have found that utilizing EMS to provide after-hour services is another really good way to keep people out of emergency rooms in the hospital. And in essence, it's sort of a, a modified version of telehealth because the patient can call, identify what the problem is, the a EMS or the ambulance service that that is uh, acting as the on-call service, can then go into the home and actually do an evaluation similar to what Olivia said, make an assessment, and then determine whether that person actually needs to go into the hospital. And we've actually found that it has decreased the number of emergency room visits, but also what we found is that when an emergency room visit is indicated, it's more likely to be an appropriate emergency room visit where they actually needed to go and may have been hospitalized. So that is sort of... The, um, I think that's going to be the wave of the future as we're continuing to look at the role of telehealth. Thank you for bringing that up, Olivia. Yeah, that's, that's really interesting, Olivia. Thanks for providing that example. We have a few more minutes for questions, and so thanks for bearing with us. Uh, Ellen, this is a question that came up during your presentation. I don't know if there's you know, one answer or a correct answer for this per se, but We'll give it a shot. So the question is, as a health plan, we don't necessarily have the breadth of staff needed for the ICT. Are there any suggestions for how we can get the benefits of the ICT within our health plan context? So I do think that's a challenging question. I think from my perspective, we would find it challenging to get the benefits of the ICT with only utilizing health plan-based staff because none of us are providing direct treatment to an individual, and it's those individuals that have, a, have that hands-on uh, direct treatment that have the ability to engage and impact the outcomes that are being sought. That's not to say, however, that we couldn't utilize our health plan-based staff in order to do a comprehensive review um, with a individual and identify action items that then could be carried out um, if you have care management, utilization management staff from an internal plan perspective. But I do feel that the biggest benefit that from an ICT is the engagement of those individuals that are uh, community-based providing those services, engaging in those services with the individual that have the highest um, impact into outcomes. 
And if I can just add something quickly to that, I, I think it, that is a challenge because we understand that there will be plans and organizations that don't have the benefit of having all of the ICT as we see the ICT. But I will say this, even if you're limited to one or two, and usually there is a minimum number of folks and um, disciplines to, to really make this effective, but if there is ongoing communication, it goes back to the whole issue of, you know, what's a high-functioning team. So you don't have all of the members of that team, but if the members of that team are adequately communicating both with the patient or the individual that's receiving the services and with the other members of the ICT, then a decision can be made at what point do we need to look for other players. At what point is in order for the plan to be able to provide the care that's needed, sometimes a decision has to be made that we're going to need to include other members for the ICT in order for us to be effective. And what does it mean to be effective? If you're reducing hospitalizations, if you're reducing visits to the emergency room, if you're increasing quality of life and quality of care for that individual who can usually tell you what that means, how they define that, then you may find that you have to go back to the drawing board and identify that there are other members that need to be a part of that ICT. And that's something that from an organization, from a plan perspective, they have to decide how do we do it. Thinking out of the box. All right, thank you guys so much. Uh, so with that, we're gonna wrap up for the day. If you have any additional questions or comments for our speakers or for Resources for Integrated Care, please feel free to email us at ric at lewin.com. The slides for today's presentation, a recording, and a transcript will be available on the Resources for Integrated Care website shortly. Before we close for the day, we also wanted to turn your attention to two upcoming Resources for Integrated Care webinars. We have a, a webinar on the Disabil Disability Confident Care Self-Assessment Tool, and that will be held on December 13th from 2 p.m. to 3 p.m. Eastern Standard. And you can also stay tuned for our 2018 Geriatric Confident Care webinars. Those will be focused on older adults with substance use disorders as well as safe and effective use of medications in older adults. Thank you again to all of the speakers. Have a wonderful afternoon, and thanks so much for your participation.